Well, thanks so very much for uh, joining us today. We've got quite a large crowd, both nationally and internationally. So good afternoon to some of you and good morning to others of you. Uh, we've done this webinar every year for about two decades. And I think of all the years uh, that I have followed developments emanating from uh, Washington, D.C. and the EEOC, this perhaps is the most interesting year uh, that we've ever seen. Uh, to kick things off, I'd like to introduce my uh, colleague and partner, Alex Karasik, who is one of our presenters today. Alex uh, has handled uh, EEOC cases throughout the United States and has served on the defense team of some of the biggest cases, including the biggest case ever filed by the EEOC. He's a thought leader in this space and regularly lectures and provides um, uh, thought leadership uh, to the media and our clients with respect to all things EEOC. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Jerry. I'm glad to be here today. Also joining us on today's panel is Jennifer Riley. Uh, Jen is a partner in the Dwayne Morris Chicago office. She is the vice chair of our class action defense group. Jen is one of our co-authors of the class action review and EEOC initiated litigation review publications. Jen has defended numerous government enforcement actions for over two decades and regularly defends EEOC pattern and practice lawsuits across the country. Pleased to join you today, Jen. Thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to start off our program today by hearing from Jerry, who chairs the Dwayne Morris Class Action Defense Group. Jerry has confronted and defended the largest and most complex EEOC cases ever filed against corporate America. This includes the largest systemic enforcement action ever brought in the history of the EEOC, EEOC versus Sterling Jewelers, uh, which Jerry defended and settled for no money. Jerry also argued a nationwide systemic case called EEOC versus Kaplan on appeal in the Sixth Circuit. That case generated one of the EEOC's most famous losses, what the Wall Street Journal called the opinion of the year. Jerry has probably handled more um, EEOC lawsuits than any other lawyer in the country. This past week, um, Law360 named Jerry as an employment law MVP. That is an award that turns on input from clients, colleagues, litigation opponents, and distinguishes Jerry as one of the top five employment lawyers in the country. With this year's honor, Jerry has won that MVP award for eight of the last 10 years. No other lawyer has won that award even twice, or excuse me, no other lawyer has won that award more than twice. So it's an honor uh, to have Jerry on our panel today. Thanks so much, Jen. Uh, we thought about what... Uh you need to know about in terms of all things EEOC when we constructed today's agenda. So we have seven topics that we think are going to arm you with everything you need to know to put the EEOC in context and to develop your own compliance strategies at your companies. And so these are some of the areas we're going to talk about, and we think it's very helpful to review uh, the analysis of the EEOC's lawsuit filings for those of you who did not know it, the EEOC's fiscal year is a little different than the calendar year. It goes from October 1 to September 30. So we're gonna talk about what occurred um, in uh, up to the minute in terms of both the lawsuits filed, uh, the industries that are impacted, and some of the most notable among the EEOC law filings, lawsuit filings. We're gonna then link those to the uh, APR, the Annual Performance Report issued by the EEOC, which is somewhat of a press release that the EEOC uses when it goes to Capitol Hill uh, to ask for a budget increase, and then the all-important strategic enforcement plan, which tells you as employers many of the things that the EEOC is focusing on and looking at in terms of effectuating its strategic plan. In our last few minutes, we'll look ahead to our predictions for what's going to occur in the coming year. Uh, so with that, let's uh, start out with that introduction on the filings, Jen. Thanks, Jerry. So as Jerry mentioned, the EEOC's fiscal year is a little different. Um, it spans from October 1 through September 30th. So when we talk about the EEOC's fiscal year for 2023, we're talking about October 1, 2022 through September 30th, 2023. 
So historically, the EEOC has filed the majority of its cases during the second half of its fiscal year, and in particular, during September, the final month of the fiscal year. So this past year was no exception. As you can see from the graph on our slide on the right hand side, the EEOC filed a total of 29 new lawsuits during the first half of this this past fiscal year, uh, which at the midpoint at the midway point of 2023 put the EEOC pretty much on par with its filings during the last um, few years. Um, per its tradition, though, the EEOC was a bit busier in terms of its filings during the second half of the fiscal year. In September alone, the EEOC filed 67 lawsuits. So that was up from what we saw in 2022 in September, where the EEOC only filed 39 lawsuits. In total this past year, the EEOC filed 144 new lawsuits. So this represents the highest number of filings we have seen since fiscal year 2019, during which the EEOC had 157. So despite this um, pretty significant bounce back in 2023, the figure is still lower when um, compared to what we saw pre-2019. In um, 2018, for instance, the EEOC, the EEOC filed 217 lawsuits. Um, in 2017, the EEOC filed 2,201 lawsuits. So um, between 2000, excuse me, between 1997 and 2011, uh, we saw about 250 to 500 new lawsuits each year. So we're still below that high water mark, um, but potentially on another upward trajectory back to that, um, back to that um, more historical um, number of filings. So this slide shows us the map. So the EEOC maintains 15 district offices and 53 field offices. And this graphic shows us the breakdown of the district offices by district. Um, so the EEOC enforcement activity is somewhat similar to real estate sometimes in that one might say, location, location, location is everything when it comes to analyzing the filings and the litigation trends. So while the EEOC is a single agency, um, when we look at the district offices, sometimes we speak of the EEOC as, as a they because the district offices vary across the, the various um, portions of the map in terms of the case types, um, the systemic filings, the priority focus areas, and, and in terms of the numbers um, that we tend to see on an annual basis. In addition to tracking the total number of filings, we also closely monitor which of those 15 district offices are the most active in terms of their filings each year. Some districts tend to be more aggressive than others, and some tend to focus on different case filing priorities. So during this past year, for fiscal year 2023, um, we saw the biggest surprise out of the Philadelphia District Office, which had by far the most lawsuit filings with 19. That was followed by the Indianapolis and the Chicago offices with 13 filings each, and they were followed in turn by the New York and the Los Angeles offices with 10 filings each. Then we had Charlotte, Atlanta, Dallas, Phoenix, Memphis, each with nine filings. So as I mentioned, the most notable trend here is probably that deluge of filings we saw out of Philadelphia with 19 as compared to only seven in 2022. Uh, similarly, the Indianapolis office with 13 lawsuit filings during fiscal year 2023 nearly doubled what we saw in 2022 when um, that office had only seven. Chicago remained steady near the top of that list um, again, whereas um, Los Angeles, New York, Charlotte, each saw a slight increase, and some others, um, Miami in particular, slightly dipped uh, compared to what we saw in fiscal year 2022. So the balance across these various district offices um, confirms that 2023 really uh, reflects a more aggressive EEOC than what we became accustomed to seeing in that 2019 to 2022 period. Yeah, and it's always struck me that when an employer negotiates uh, either uh, to get a case dismissed or to resolve it, uh, the employer is negotiating with the regional trial attorney in each of these district offices, and they all have different interests. They all approach problems differently. And so you're not dealing, as you said, with an it, a single agency. 
you're dealing with a, a, a they in terms of different things. And the startling statistic that jumps out to me here is Philadelphia being the leader here far and away, obviously under third circuit law, and San Francisco having the least number of cases, and yet probably sitting in the Ninth Circuit, it has very mature, very well-developed law uh, under uh, Title VII and the ADA. Do you have any inside baseball uh, tips as to uh, why uh, Philadelphia is far ahead and San Francisco is lagging so far behind? That's great insight, Jerry. Um, absolutely. So as you mentioned, um, some of those offices have um, cases already in the pipeline. So what we're seeing here on the slides are really the new case filings um, during the past fiscal year. Um, and it doesn't necessarily reflect how busy the office is in terms of what they already have in the pipeline um, coming into 2023. Makes good sense. Um, we also analyze cases by type of filing. And this uh, pie chart and um, these columns show the totals in each particular area. And the way we did this is day by day, lawsuit by lawsuit, we examined and analyzed every single filing that the EEOC made uh, throughout the year. And uh, once again, the top two areas are the ADA and Title VII. And most of the systemic cases, the real danger cases that involve big groups of people tend to be filed um, as Title VII cases. Um, onesie twosie cases more often than not filed under the ADA. I was recently asked uh, by a member of the media why the ADA filings are so high. And my sense was that um, ADA cases are fact specific uh, based on the case law that has developed under the statute. Those sorts of cases are more impervious to summary judgment. And so ever since the ADA uh, uh, was filed, uh, became enacted, uh, the uh, EEOC has been a frequent user of the ADA statute in bringing its cases. And um, uh, over the last 12 months, that was certainly true again. Um, basically, Title VII, uh, race, gender, national origin, make up 68%, which is, one, which is what one might expect. And it's held kind of steady over the last few years in the 60s, whereas ADA cases have basically been in the 30s. Uh, the one area where we saw a jump were ADEA cases, age discrimination cases. And procedurally, those are very different. Um, my personal opinion is the EEOC probably has a bit of an easier time litigating age discrimination cases from a procedural standpoint the hoops that the commission needs to jump through than as compared to ADA and Title VII cases. The head scratcher for me, uh, the statistic is only three cases brought under the Equal Pay Act. Uh, if you read the EEOC's public pronouncements, which I do, um, its press releases, its statements on Capitol Hill, uh, things it uh, sends to Congress when it's asking for its budget uh, to be approved, uh, combating unequal pay, uh, is something that is near and dear to the EOC's heart, and yet it doesn't translate into filings. And I've always thought that was an area where the EOC uh, was always angling and looking to bring more cases. And the fact that there were only three brought uh, in uh, its fiscal year uh, says a lot, uh, maybe about the inventory or just um, how difficult maybe it is to prove those particular cases, especially on a systemic basis. Alex, what about industries that were impacted by the filings? Yeah, Jerry, this is a very interesting area. I know Jerry and Jen just broke down where these lawsuits are getting filed and under what types of theories they're getting filed. But a third unique perspective of what industries are impacted the most. And year after year, we tend to see hospitality either at the top of this list or near the top of this list. And as you can see on this graphic, restaurants is clearly ahead in number one with 28 lawsuits filings in the past uh, fiscal year. Retail and, and healthcare are close by in second with 24 each, followed by manufacturing, which is a distant fourth at 15. So these industries clearly are breeding grounds for EEOC type uh, litigation. And some may wonder why that is. Well, one thought is that employees in this industry are often working close together in close proximity in spaces, long shifts. In the hospitality industry in general, there's oftentimes 
you know, fun environments. You have guests or customers who are coming in, consuming alcohol, kind of a lively entertainment type feel to it. And sometimes the employees may let their guards down and, and these can be situations where people do things that are often not appropriate for the workplace. Healthcare as well. People oftentimes are working long shifts in there. As Jerry mentioned, with the high number of ADA claims, there could be a lot of different medical type concerns or requests for accommodation that are going on in the healthcare space. So it's not a surprise to see these three industries at the top. But if you continue studying this graphic, you'll see that really no industry is safe from EEOC initiated litigation. Construction and transportation, both with seven, automotive with six, security with six, and technology sector with five filings. It's clear that it's spread out across all industries where the EEOC is getting these types of charges of discrimination, no matter what an employer does and what sector they're in, and they're prosecuting those claims. And one final thought for, for restaurants and hospitality and retail is that these are often on-premises sites. Whereas, for instance, if you're at a remote position with a call center, you're working from home, you might not have as many EEOC charges in that type of space. A security guard, you're often working by yourself, right? Or maybe someone's walking a premises or working behind a video surveillance. Whereas in a restaurant, retail, healthcare, people are rubbing elbows all the time. So I think that's uh, that's certainly a good reason for the for those data points. Yeah, Alex, I think that there's one other data point that I've always found interesting. If you uh, disassemble and look at the lawsuits brought against uh, the food service or restaurant industry, and that would be with respect to the number of claims the EOC brings on behalf of teenagers, part-time workers, summer workers, workers that the EOC deems to be uh, exceedingly vulnerable uh, to alleged uh, harassment, especially sexual harassment, where an adult uh, is involved in that particular interaction and the teenager is the victim. And I think uh, one thing that I have seen in the last probably five to seven years is uh, an uptick and uh, something the EEOC uh, deems to be very important in terms of its mission, not only in protecting vulnerable workers that uh, have English as a second language who might not be citizens of the United States, but defining a vulnerable worker in terms of age, uh, one that is a teenager and confronting uh, harassment situations in the workplace when it comes to interacting with adults. Well, that, that, go ahead. That's a great point, Jerry. And I would add to that that we're seeing more and more of these types of cases in part because hospitality employers are seeking to fill gaps in employment. And right now it's it's difficult. A lot of restaurants throughout the country are having trouble you know, retaining and, and hiring new employees. So one of the things they're doing is more aggressively looking towards teenagers, figuring out what each state's unique labor laws are for, for minors and whether or not they can get them in the workplace and what types of hours. And a lot of times, as Jerry mentioned, you know, the, the, these minors are often vulnerable. It might be their first ever job, first time working in a, an organization like this. And, and these situations can often lead to instances where there's harassment, discrimination, and inappropriate behavior. So it's something that I think we're going to see over the next coming years. Employers will be important for them to educate their managers and their, and their workforce on how to adapt and incorporate minor employees without running afoul of Title VII and other uh, state and local laws. Good points. Our next slide will start and Alex will lead the discussion on what we can learn from the actual lawsuits that were filed by the EEOC this year. And when you look at the industries. The other thing to look at is the issue, because remember, the EEOC can't be everywhere, can't file all lawsuits against all employers. And so what you see is the EEOC being selective about issues it's litigating or bringing cases against uh, particular members of an industry because that will send a signal to the rest of the industry or sometimes picking on a very small player at an industry on the theory that a smaller employer, when the weight of the federal government falls upon it, is unable to defend itself, and the EEOC, in essence, gets a quick kill, gets some precedent, gets something that it can use uh, in terms of uh, trying to enforce the statute through litigation, uh, that the mere filing of lawsuits sends a messages to companies about, there by the grace of God goes me, in terms of these 
lawsuit filings. Alex, what about uh, some of those notable filings? Great question, Jerry. So one of the new areas or most emerging areas in EEOC initiated litigation over the last five years, or, or more particularly over the last three years, has involved gender identity and sexual orientation discrimination. And a lot of this stems from the 2020 U.S. Supreme Court decision in Bostock versus Clayton County, which ultimately held that federal law prohibits employment discrimination against LGBTQ workers on the basis of their sexual orientation or transgender identity. And that was a landmark case that really changed the, the landscape of Title VII, because prior to that, it was unclear whether or not Title VII protected workers in this class. But now that they are, the EEOC has made it part of its core mission to eradicate discrimination among LGBTQ workers in the workforce. So when we're seeing that come to fruition now, following that decision, we'd imagine that there's been a lot more charges involving sexual orientation or transgender identity uh, in the charge phase. And now some of those charges that were filed in 2020, 2021, 2022 are percolating through the EEOC charge phase into litigation. And we think this is an area that's going to be significantly litigated uh, over the next five years and beyond. And one example of such a case is EEOC versus T.C. Wheeler. And this is a case that was filed in the Western District of New York in March of 2023. There, the EEOC brought a lawsuit on behalf of charging party who alleged that employees harassed a transgender male employee because of his gender identity, including telling the employee comments about he wasn't a real man and asking invasive questions about his transition. And these types of comments the EEOC found problematic and they also alleged that other employees made anti-transgender comments and continually referred to the employee by using female pronouns. And the issue of gender identity and pronouns, again, has become something that's increasingly more uh, prevalent in the workplace. And for those employers that haven't gotten around to training employees on what are the proper way to address certain individuals in their workforce, this case is an example of how such behavior can ultimately amount to and lead to EEOC initiated litigation. So among other 2023 filings, and then when we do next year's webinar, we anticipate there will be even more cases involving sexual orientation and gender uh, identity and in terms of looking to protect the workers in this category. How about colorblindness? This is a unique one and, and one that's not you're going to see every day in EEOC initiated litigation. But here, the EEOC filed a lawsuit against Union Pacific Railroad Company in federal court in Minnesota on September 19th, I'm sorry, September 29th, 2023, which is essentially the 11th hour before the, the end of the EEOC's fiscal year. There, the EEOC alleged violations of the ADA when the employer used an unlawful qualification standard to screen out workers if they failed color vision tests without attempting to accommodate. And this might be relevant, for instance, when you're operating a railroad or, or whatnot, seeing being able to see and read the signs. But nonetheless, the, the EEOC uh, looked at the standard that was used there and looked at some of the color uh, blindness testing that was done there to determine uh, whether or not these vision tests unlawfully screened out um, a class of potential applicants or employees. So that's another one that's unique in terms of the, the ADA type cases that Jerry talked about, which we've seen increasingly get filed more and more year after year. And then finally, pregnancy discrimination litigation has long been an area of focus for the commission as uh, employers oftentimes, these are types of cases where employers are accused of screening out pregnant workers or improperly uh, accommodating them in terms of certain side effects due to the pregnancy. And here, the EEOC accused a uh, assisted living facility in Florida about uh, firing a nurse, certified nursing assistant after learning she was pregnant and rejecting her argument and rejecting arguments that doing so was illegal. Robert Weisberg, a regional attorney for the EEOC's Miami District Office, said in a statement, while this case was brought under Title VII, which has been protecting pregnant workers for decades, it highlights the need for broader protections now in place under the new Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. And we'll discuss that act a little bit more in today's uh, presentation, but for purposes of this lawsuit filing, it's extremely important for employers to know that the EEOC closely scrutinizes uh, requests for accommodations um, for pregnant employees, and even on the outset, 
takes an even stricter look at employers who don't give opportunities to em employees once they find out that they are pregnant. Alex, I think it's interesting, this slide, because it shows uh, to me the mosaic of considerations that the EEOC uses when it selects cases to uh, bring. The first case with T.C. Wheeler is a stretch the envelope. Let's uh, litigate a case to create either new law or to uh, effectuate the public policy of Title VII in the broadest way possible. Um, the colorblindness case with the Union Pacific is suing an industry leader and using that uh, in terms of an ADA systemic case to regulate uh, the industry. And then with pregnancy, uh, it's the EEOC focusing on an important issue. So in terms of this enumeration of notable filings, you see a little bit of all the types of things that go into the EEOC's uh, thinking when it selects its cases, what employers to sue and what issues to, to sue them on. Let's look at um, some additional disability related filings from fiscal year 2023. So given the prevalence of um, attention that COVID-19 occupied and in particular the vaccine related debate, um, that emerged um, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, uh, we anticipated that there would be a surge of exemption-related cases coming through the EEOC's charge intake system. Um, the results don't disappoint. Um, that is just one of the types of um, litigation we're seeing under the umbrella of disability-related claims. Uh, in terms of the ones on the slide, the first one we have listed there is EEOC versus United Healthcare Services. Um, that's an interesting case in that when the EEOC alleges that an employer violated federal law when it refused to grant a full-time telecommuter a religious exemption from the company's COVID-19 vaccine requirement. Um, the EEOC alleges there that the charging party received multiple notifications that she needed to obtain the vaccine, even though the company's vaccine policy stated that it did not apply to full-time telecommuters. Um, and the allegation there goes on to allege that the employee eventually received an ultimatum either got a vaccine or um, be fired within 30 days. The next one on the slide deals with um, deaf or hard of hearing workers in EEOC versus Alliance Ground International. The EEOC alleges that the employer there, a cargo, an airline cargo services provider, rejected a job applicant because of a hearing impairment. Um, and the EEOC alleges that the defendant actually has a, po has a policy or practice of refusing to hire individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing rather than providing them with reasonable accommodations. Um, the third one there, EEOC versus Zoe Center for Pediatric and Adolescent Health. Um, that one, and that one, the EEOC alleges that the employer, which was a, which is a pediatric clinic, fired an employee after she asked to work remotely near her emotional support animal to better manage her mental health disorders. The EEOC released a press release there that said the termination was contemporaneous with the employer's denial of a reasonable accommodation request, uh, which signaled a clear violation of the ADA. You know, Jen and Alex, you both spend a lot of time helping employers with ADA-related issues. And one of the uh, vexing issues I've always thought about was um, the pandemic demonstrated uh, in real time that not all jobs need to be performed in the office and that some jobs can be performed remotely. Uh, but many employers, for good reason, want people to come into the office and believe uh, that uh, being able to team, collaborate, and be present in the office is a very important attribute of the job, if not a job requirement. Um, what are your, what's your thinking about how the EEOC is litigating that issue about um, reasonable accommodations with people working at home in jobs where there's case law in the books three, four, five years before the pandemic, where judges endorsed employers looking at the um, uh, defense argument that it was an undue burden for someone to work at home. 
how can employers now today argue the undue burden given the experience of going through COVID? Great question, Jerry. And certainly we're seeing that come up as a theme, um, particularly in some of the cases I just talked about where the EEOC is not, not necessarily hitting head on or attacking head on the remote work issue, but it's popping up in various ways, which suggests a theme there of the EEOC taking a stance on the availability and the use of remote work and maybe trying to shift the thinking there in terms of um, making it more prevalent as a potential accommodation um, to the types of issues that are coming up. Alex, I don't know if you have more thoughts on that one. Yeah, that's a great point, Jen. And I would also like to add, it's interesting because the EEOC and a lot of government uh, agencies themselves were working remote for a long time during the pandemic. So I think the EEOC and a lot of the people who are deciding these issues have actual experience working remote. And if you have an investigator that was able to do it, or they were investigating, you know, cases involving discrimination allegations remotely and able to do their jobs, they may ask an employer, you know, was it really necessary for this particular person to be in? And I think in many instances, the answer is still yes. I mean, companies still need people in the office in certain, you know, industries and in certain sectors of the economy. It's very important. But others, if it's something that can be done remotely and it's an employee that's going to cause them a burden or really need that accommodation, that threshold is really a moving target in terms of where we are today versus where we may have been several years ago. And I think it'll be interesting to see kind of where that line goes in the next five years. Great comments. Jen, what about uh, race and genetic um, discrimination lawsuits? Thanks, Jerry. So race continues to be a hot topic in terms of EEOC enforcement. Several events involving race discrimination over the past few years, um, I think, continue to make this a continued area of focus and priority uh, for the EEOC, as reflected also in its filings. Uh, in the one we mentioned on the slide, the EEOC um, sued three subway franchisees, alleging that they select they subjected employees to racial discrimination. There, the EEOC asserted that the owner regularly made racist statements regarding um, Black individuals and terminated workers because they are Black. So there, the EEOC asserted that the harassment was severe and pervasive, and also that the owner criticized traditionally Black hairstyles um, and fired an employee with dreadlocks. So that is, it is a particular um, allegation that um, we expect to see uh, repeated um, in additional filings. Um, by contrast, their genetic information, um, that's where we are not seeing as many filings. In fact, this one on the slide, EEOC versus Resource One, notably was the only filing in fiscal year 2023 alleging violations of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA. According to the complaint in that case, the charging party received results from an at-home DNA test showing that she had ancestry from Cameroon and the Congo, and the EEOC alleged that upon learning of the DNA test results, her workplace supervisor began harassing her with racial and national origin slurs. So again, um, we expect that the EEOC is going to continue to pursue race discrimination claims on a priority basis, um, but Gina, I'm not generating nearly as many, as many lawsuits um, as what we're seeing in the race area. One of my takeaways from this particular slide is uh, the EEOC's uh, strategy in terms of suing a smaller player, uh, a subway franchisee in a very important race discrimination case on the theory that an entity like that probably uh, doesn't have an unlimited war chest with which to defend itself is probably going to be trying to resolve that case if the plaintiff's uh, the claimants, the EEOC are able to prove their allegations. And so uh, that happens quite often where the EEOC brings very important lawsuits against very small employers to try and uh, create a default situation or to create uh, a settlement uh, that it can use against the rest of the industry, that being a restaurant case, which again, as Alex had related, is the number one area. And then I think the EOCV Resource One is certainly kind of on the cutting edge of the law 
trying to uh, create new law. So I think that two of those 2003 lawsuits uh, very telling in terms of what it shows employers. So um, one of the things that occurred at about nine o'clock Eastern on Friday night, September 29, the last business day of the EEOC's fiscal year was the EEOC issued a press release and it's unprecedented in its history. It's never done that before. And the press release, in essence, touted um, the EEOC's record uh, over the prior uh, 364 days about how big it had increased its lawsuit filing docket uh, and over 50%. And that of that docket, it included 25 systemic lawsuits, which are lawsuits on behalf of groups typically a very large group of employees, uh, where the EEOC touted that this was the largest filing of systemic lawsuits um, in the last five years. So uh, what you have is exhibit one, I would suggest, of a very activist agency, an agency that is going to spend the taxpayer dollars to stretch those dollars and file uh, an increased number of lawsuits and big uh, systemic lawsuits that make a statement. And so what you're seeing is uh, the EEOC loaded for bear looks very different today than it might have looked a year ago. And it's uh, kind of an extension of the Biden labor and employment policy in terms of uh, what it views the EEOC as an agency ought to be doing in terms of spending the taxpayer dollars. If you peel back the onion skin and look behind what it's done, the EEOC and its APR, it's called its annual performance report, kind of puts together uh, its activities in terms of uh, what it's done in spending the taxpayer dollars. And again, it touted uh, that it basically uh, took down or collected $40 million more than before, uh, 513.7 million compared to 485 million uh, just two years ago, on behalf of 38,000 uh, victims of discrimination. And this would include charges, uh, charges that were mediated, uh, lawsuits, uh, and that it had nearly a, a jump ball, 50% uh, track record in terms of successfully uh, conciliating cases. So the ESC is investing more in its mediation process after a charge of discrimination is filed. Uh, here, there were 73,000 filed uh, last year, a big uptick in the number of filings during the pandemic. It was depressed. One of the reasons we thought is less people going into work, less interaction with uh, other workers and employers. Um, now you're seeing uh, the needle uh, trending upward, uh, and you're seeing many, many, many more discrimination charges uh, than before. Uh, and um, you're seeing more lawsuits. So kind of the, the watchwords and the takeaways from all of this is the EEOC is busy. The EEOC is adding investigators. The EEOC is filing more lawsuits. The EEOC is very strategic in the manner in which it files a lawsuit. There's a method behind its case selection where in the United States it files them, which particular employers it targets, which particular industries are under the radar and what particular issues uh, are being litigated. And I think a lot of that uh, stems from uh, the strategic enforcement plan. And uh, Jen and Alex and I think the SEP, the strategic enforcement plan is well worth a read by any corporate counsel or senior vice president of human resources because of what it tells you in terms of uh, the areas the EEOC is looking at. So we'd like to turn to that and quickly go through the SEP in terms of the takeaways for employers. Jen? Thanks, Jerry. So as Jerry mentioned last month, the EEOC published its strategic enforcement plan for fiscal years 2024 through 2028. The EEOC described the strategic enforcement plan as establishing its subject matter priorities to achieve its mission and to advance its vision. Um, so these are important um, categories to be aware of in terms of e the EEOC six priority areas uh, for enforcement during the upcoming years. 
The first there is eliminating barriers in recruitment and hiring. This is actually a very broad um, focus. It, um, the EOC described it as um, a focus on discriminatory recruitment and hiring practices and, and policies. And it includes myriad things from the use of technology, including artificial intelligence and machine learning to target job advertisements, recruit applicants, even to make or assist in hiring decisions. Uh, it also includes the use of job advertisements that the EEOC views as excluding or discouraging certain protected groups from applying. It includes channeling or steering individuals into specific jobs or job duties, again, based on um, alleged protected characteristics. Um, it also includes policies or practices that limit on-the-job training or apprenticeship programs or internships based on protected characteristics. And these are just a few of the examples. The number two enforcement priority there, protecting vulnerable workers and persons from underserved communities from discrimination. The EEOC says there that it will focus on harassment, retaliation, job segregation, labor trafficking, discriminatory pay, um, among other things that particularly in impact vulnerable workers, which it describes as anything from migrant workers, disabled individuals, older workers, including temporary workers, individuals employed in low-wage jobs, including teenaged workers, as Jerry mentioned earlier, as well as individuals with arrest or conviction records, um, individuals with limited literacy or English proficiency, as well as LGBTQI plus individuals, among others. Um, enforcement priority number three, addressing selected emerging and developing issues. There, the EEOC notes that it will continue to prioritize issues that may be emerging or developing, including issues influenced by local, national, or global events. So for instance, discrimination against religious minorities, racial or ethnic groups um, may fall into this category, as well as discrimination associated with the long-term effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Priority number four, advancing equal pay for all workers. The EEOC, the EEOC notes there that it will continue to focus on combating pay discrimination on the basis of sex as well as other protected categories. It notes there, interestingly, that because many workers do not know how their pay compares to their coworkers and therefore may be less likely to discover or report pay discrimination, the commission will continue to use its directed investigation um, as well as commissioner charge tools um, as appropriate to facilitate uh, enforcement. Again, as Jerry mentioned earlier, while this is about the 10th year in a row, we've seen this topic as a priority in the strategic enforcement plan. We have yet to see a lot of litigation um, in this area. Uh, number five, preserving access to the legal system. There, the EEOC notes that it will focus on policies and practices that discourage individuals from exercising rights or impeding the EEOC's investigative or enforcement efforts. This priority, priority includes um, policy or practices that deter filing charges. Among other things, it includes a focus on what the EEOC describes as, an, as overly broad waivers, releases, non-disclosure agreements, non-disparagement agreements, and also unlawful, unenforceable, or otherwise improper mandatory arbitration agreements. Then number six, preventing and remedying, remedying um, systemic harassment. Um, the EEOC notes that harassment, both in person and online, remains an issue of serious concern. Um, it noted in its strategic enforcement plan that over 34% of the charges of employment discrimination the EEOC received between 2018 and 2022 included an allegation of harassment. So expect to see the EEOC continuing to focus on strong enforcement um, and promotion of anti-harassment programs. Thanks, Jen. So that dovetails nicely into our next segment where we're going to discuss the EEOC strategic plan as well as what employers can expect for 2024 and beyond. The EEOC strategic plan, or SP, is an important publication for employers because it previews the immediate action areas that will be the focus for the commission. 
It serves as an overarching framework for the EEOC's mission, and the SCP works together with the strategic plan by establishing substantive law enforcement priorities. So the focus here is on discrimination, conciliation, litigation, and increasing the commission's capacity for litigating alleged systemic violations, which Jerry talked about are oftentimes the large scale cases that focus on a particular industry or region or often a larger organization where there could be multiple, uh, sometimes even thousands of employees involved. Um, and the SP focuses on how the EEOC is trying to ramp up and adequately investigate and, and prosecute these types of claims. Moving into the fiscal year 2024, the EEOC's budget includes a $26.069 million increase. So what can employers inspect with that additional $26 million of funding from the EEOC? Well, the EEOC will be probably using that money to train its in, in investigative teams, its enforcement teams, provide this type of education that will be more aggressive to go out and investigate these types of claims and be more better equipped uh, to prosecute systemic litigation systemic uh, discrimination litigation claims and other claims uh, across the country. So more budget likely means more activity for the EEOC, which means employers should be more alert. Um, some of the key areas of the SP are enforcement, education and outreach, and organizational excellence. Enforcement involves, um, like Jen described, working together with the SCP to provide a substantive law priorities and to that end, the EEOC will be trying to enforce these cases by training staff on what to look for when they're deciding what could be a systemic case and devoting resources to actually filing those cases. Education and outreach. The EEOC has been very active in trying to engage stakeholders from all different perspectives, whether it's employers, employees, technology providers, for the AI types claims that Jen mentioned. Those are the different education and outreach efforts and getting out in the community to show what the EEOC does. And then organizational excellence. The SP makes clear that organizational excellence is a cornerstone of achieving the EEOC strategic goals. And the EEOC is working to improve its culture on accountability, inclusivity, accessibility. And that's some of those things that we're gonna discuss more on the next slide. Alex, um, I've heard it said, uh, and, and as an, uh, a viewer of what the EOC does, uh, I think there's some truth into it, but that the strategic enforcement plan, the strategic plan, the press release, the annual report um, is something the EOC uses on Capitol Hill to make its case with the Congress for a budget increase and that um, not all budget increases are honored. Sometimes they're cut in half. Uh, during the Trump administration, they were cut more than in half, more than 100%. Um, do you think that the EEOC's budget, um, uh, they're doing the best they can with the dollars there, or do you think that the EEOC has kind of hit a wall in terms of what it can do without more money? Great question, Jerry. I think the EEOC itself is using new technologies and looking for different ways to make its uh, systems more streamlined and more efficient. The EEOC has become increasingly digital over the last several years. And I think the EEOC is looking for different ways to get the most out of every dollar. I think a lot of these reports you mentioned equip the EEOC with statistics and data. So when they go to Capitol Hill, they can advocate for the most amount of dollars and talk about ways they're using different emerging technologies to try to reach their constituents and get more you know, money that they can use to, to fulfill their mission over the, the course of the coming years. So looking ahead to 2024, what's next for the EEOC? Well, in many organizations uh, across the, the country and the world have really uh, put an effort and emphasis on their own DEI efforts. And the EEOC goes one step further by including accessibility or DEIA program. And the EEOC, like many organizations that they, they work with in, in adjudicating discrimination cases, is uh, looking to increase workplace diversity, employee equity, inclusivity practices and accessibility and finding accessibility as they've mentioned with Jerry when filing all the different disability lawsuits they're also trying to increase their own accessibility for their own employees and workforce. The second bullet here is one of the ones I think will be the greatest uh, impact on the EEOC in the next five to ten years might be the artificial artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. In 2021 the EEOC announced its artificial intelligence and algorithmic 
Fairness Initiative. And essentially what the EEOC is looking to do is analyze how addressing, uh, I'm sorry, emerging technologies such as software that involves the hiring processes, recruitment and pay decisions and using machine learning and all these different type of new emerging technologies, what impact do they have on discrimination? Are they having a disparate impact on certain categories of workers? The EEOC has been very, very uh, vocal in this space over the last two years. And the EEOC, even in May of 2023, published a document that provides a Q&A for how employers can look at these AI type technologies and determine whether or not they're potentially having a disparate impact on hiring decisions. Commissioner Keith Sunderling has spoken all over the world about AI issues, and the EEOC itself has been publishing a lot of guidance documents over the last two years. And this is an area that's absolutely not going anywhere. It's going to continue to be analyzed, dissected. And even this past year, the EEOC announced its first settlement of an AI case, and this one involving a tutoring group that automatically rejected an applicant after her birthday uh, that she typed into an application showed that she was over the age of uh, 55. And that, that case right there, the, the applicant actually typed in a new birthday, changed nothing else on her application, and got hired by using her fake birthday when the only requirement was to have a bachelor's degree. So I think the EEOC settlement of that case for $365,000 on behalf of 200 applicants reflects the EEOC now as a roadmap for how to prosecute AI-related discrimination cases involving software bias. And that's definitely going to be an emerging issue going forward. And then finally, a very interesting development, the EEOC uh, joined forces with the DOL and the NLRB, two other government agencies on the anti-retaliation initiative. And it's not often that you'll see these different branches of government that prosecute different types of claims, lock arms and join together in a common mission. But here they did exactly that to look at retaliation in the workplace. Uh, and that'll be something interesting to monitor to see whether these different branches of government enforcement agencies continue to pick up the phone, call each other, work together to try to uh, eradicate a common issue such as retaliation. Alex, that's a really important roadmap of what employers can expect for the coming 12 months. My own personal opinion is the EEOC is searching now and trying to find uh, the quintessential AI case uh, that it can bring and litigate that would establish a precedent and it's uh, probably bad facts make bad law, but it's looking for the exact set of facts that will present to a court uh, a situation that the EOC thinks it can win and that it will make law on. So I think that uh, employers using artificial intelligence have to be uh, uber aware of the EOC's special radar and focus on that particular area and that, that that is an area that is uh, laden with risk uh, that more often than not is gonna see uh, the inside of a courtroom in the next uh, 12 to 24 months. That's a great point, Jared. It'll be interesting to see how that case is closely monitored by employers, AI vendors, employees, and the different interplay of all these constituents because it's certainly gonna have a profound impact beyond just the employment law sphere, but in the business world generally. Um, and finally, looking ahead to 2024, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, uh, as we mentioned earlier, is a closely uh, monitored uh, legislative piece that I think is going to have a significant impact as well. Public comment period closed on October 11th, 2023, regarding the EEOC's proposed rule for the PWFA. And that's something employers should definitely monitor because pregnancy discrimination has long been something that's a crux of the EEOC's mission. And uh, that'll be one to watch. And finally, recently on October 2nd, 2023, the EEOC announced updates to its enforcement guidance on harassment in the workplace. And this is a really important document for employers to get their hands on and, and look at because it talks about many different types of examples of what might constitute harassment, what the different categories of harassment might look like. Interestingly, there are 350 footnotes, which that in itself could probably be a book, but that shows that the commission's being really thorough and trying to gather you know, information from all different types of stakeholders and trying to be really thorough in terms of what they're doing to get the most uh, practical guidance out there for businesses. This was the first EEOC's uh, update on workplace harassment since 1999, and that'll definitely be one to watch as it's open for public comment on November 1st, 2023, and we'll see what happens next there. 
But that's a tour of the 2024. And next, Jerry will discuss some key changes within the EEOC's own walls and how it might impact uh, the commission in the upcoming years. Before we turn to that, Alex, I think an important uh, distinction for our uh, guest today is to understand the use of the enforcement guidance. I've uh, had the privilege to represent employers in many EEOC-related lawsuits where the EEOC tries to use its own enforcement guidance as uh, a piece of evidence, so to speak, to sway a federal judge to interpret or uh, the law in a certain way. So make no bones about it. The enforcement guidance is an advocacy piece where the EEOC says, this is what we think the law should be. And this is how we're gonna argue the issue in court. And not all federal judges buy into that on the theory that sometimes the EEOC uh, as an advocate is interpreting what the law uh, requires um, in, in an expansive way uh, that is not um, loyal to the statutory language. And there have been certain cases where federal district court judges have said, no, the enforcement guidance is wrong or inapplicable or invalid because that's not what Title VII, that's not what the ADA requires. So. Um, there's two ways to read that enforcement guidance if you're an employer. One is, I want to stay out of the courthouse. I don't want to be in a situation where I'm a test case. I don't want to be arguing to a judge, don't follow the enforcement guidance, and therefore I'm aware of it, I'll follow it, and I'll try to have the best workplace possible. I'll try to not allow harassment to occur. If it does occur, I'll immediately investigate it, remediate it and take actions to make sure it doesn't occur again. And therefore the enforcement guidance is valuable in terms of knowing what the EEOC might sue me on. Uh, the other way to view it is it's the EEOC's version of what they wish the law would be. And it doesn't necessarily mean that is exactly what the law is if an employer is forced to litigate it. So uh, important to know that it is uh, uh, truly an advocacy piece. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the changes in the leadership, and they're important. Uh, in the last two months, the EOC finally has its full complement of commissioners. There are, by law and regulation, five commissioners. Kalpana Kadigal became the fifth commissioner. Uh, she uh, has a background from the Cohen Milstein firm, uh, a very able lawyer. I've litigated uh, multiple cases uh, against her. She's very good at what she does. Uh, and she is viewed as probably someone who's going to become a leader and a future chairperson of the EEOC. Once she joined and she was confirmed, the Democrats uh, now enjoy a three to two majority, which is traditionally what occurs when uh, the White House is uh, has a Democratic president, that there'll be three to two majority among commissioners. And what you saw in the last two months was kind of the uh, impediments to issuing the enforcement guidance all the regulations, uh, the authorization, the lawsuits all were released and came about. So one would expect the EOC is now open for business, so to speak, and you're going to see a lot of initiatives and an activist organization in operation. Um, Carla Gilbride is the acting EOC general counsel. She's almost functions like a sixth commissioner, very important in terms of being the head lawyer at the EOC. She likewise, like Ms. Cottigal, comes from a civil rights and plaintiff's employment background, very able lawyer, very able advocate. So that gives you a tour of the EEOC world. Uh, and we've reached our bewitching hour after 60 minutes. We had mentioned that we put together an annual EEOC litigation review. Uh, if You can get it off our website or just even scan it right here on the QR code. And if you have not already, uh, subscribe to our uh, Dwayne Morris Class Action uh, um, uh, uh, website. We uh, invite you to uh, subscribe to our defense blog, listen to our Friday uh, podcasts, and learn all things uh, employment-related um, and EEOC-related litigation. So thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. We hope we've provided you with food for thought and things to think about in terms of getting ahead of these issues and 
all things EEOC. So have a great afternoon.